So it's an extraordinary uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Claire White. Uh, Claire's work truly exemplifies the beauty of uh, material science. So her work uh, focuses on optimizing engineering and environmental materials. Uh, these include sustainable construction and carbon capture. And as a result, her work not only expands the frontiers of material science knowledge, but it also addresses uh, existential environmental challenges. I'll just tell you that uh, Claire is a superstar. She's an associate professor in Princeton's uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and she's the acting associate director of the, of the Andlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. She holds associate faculty status in multiple departments across Princeton. These include departments of chemical and biological engineering. She also holds, holds an associate faculty status in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. It really highlights uh, Claire's broad base of expertise. She also uh, holds uh, a faculty status in the Princeton Institute for the Science and Technology of Materials, High Meadows Environmental Institute, and Princeton, Princeton Institute for Computational Science and Engineering. She's a recipient of numerous awards. This includes the NSF Career, uh, the Gustavo Colinetti Medal, and Howard B. Wentz Jr. Jr. Faculty Award at Princeton. Uh, and not only is she exceptional in her research and has been recognized for that, but she's also an exceptional teacher. She's been recognized many times uh, for outstanding teaching as a member of the faculty at Princeton University. So let's give uh, Claire a warm welcome and uh, looking forward to hearing about the material science of sustainable cements. Take it away, Claire. Sounds good. Thank you very much for that kind and uh, overly embellished introduction. I, um, I'm always, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's great to hear when people talk like this, but it always makes me feel a little bit embarrassed. Um, nevertheless, I'll, I'll get started. So <clears throat> before I begin, what I want to uh, let people know is I have the chat window open on Zoom. So if there's any questions as I go along, do feel free to uh, type them in the chat for those of you that are uh, virtually attending. Um, if you're in the audience there, I don't know how easy it is to kind of shout out and ask a question, um, but I'd prefer if you have a question to ask it um, as opposed to wait to the end. Um, so we'll see how we go. Um, so as uh, Ryan uh, mentioned, I have a joint appointment between Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Andlinger Centre for en Energy and the Environment. Um, but I also am uh, uh, associated with uh, essentially the Materials Centre. We don't have a, a materials department on campus, we have a centre. Um, and so what this means is, uh, although you can't, uh, uh, well, we because we don't have the department, it's a little bit different, but uh, there's a lot of faculty on campus that do materials research. And so it's based around this center. Um, so introduction to uh, the research and, and uh, what I, um, sorry, I've got to get this one to work. Uh, what I focus on, um, the, the, the basis or the motivation for the research really stems from Oh, I think it's been a while with Zoom. So here we go, I've got it working. Um, the basis for the research stems from uh, sustainability and CO2 emissions. Um, so a lot of people are, well, you're all aware of electricity generation and the fact that um, fossil fuels, if you burn them, you generate CO2, um, which is being released into the atmosphere at present. Um, the same is true for if you're heating and cooling buildings, um, CO2 at the moment is being released into the atmosphere due to the energy requirements. What's not so well known is that there's certain industries that are also contributing to CO2 emissions. And so if you look at the engineering materials that we use, concrete and steel, uh, one component in concrete, it's manufacturing, the cement powder, it's actually responsible for about 8% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And then if you look at steel production, um, there's two steps to it. And you add those together and look at the emissions associated with those, you're looking at 7% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So these two industries alone account for uh, quite a, a portion of CO2 emissions uh, that's contributing to climate change. So what, what can we do about this? Well, if 
uh, previously with the industries, they would say, well, we, we can't not build with concrete, we can't not build with steel, um, we're going to have emissions associated with them. But uh, more recently, over the past couple of decades, there's been uh, an understanding that there are innovations that can happen in these industries, and there are ways that the CO2 reductions can be achieved. Um, and so I'm not going to go into all of the details, especially for iron and steel. I'll mention a couple for concrete. But uh, through the material science research, in, in conjunction with engineering and applied research, there's uh, inroads being made to how we can make concrete more sustainable, yet have it perform uh, in the same way that uh, current day concrete is performing. So in terms of, uh, in addition to being able to decarbonize the steel industry through say using hydrogen fuel instead of fossil fuels, there's also some alternative materials that um, can be used such as carbon fiber reinforced polymers. Um, but if we look at concrete itself, um, what I'm gonna explain is where the CO2 emissions come from concrete production. Um, one of the steps involves uh, decomposition of calcium carbonate, uh, limestone, which is abundant on the Earth's crust. And it's hard to avoid the CO2 emissions that's associated with this uh, decomposition process that happens in the kiln. Um, but there are ways that people are uh, they're tackling this challenge, um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail soon. So to give you a bit of an overview of my, what my group does at Princeton, um, we're very much focused on materials and the material science. Uh, we look at blended and alternative cements as a means of uh, reducing uh, CO2 emissions associated with concrete usage. But at the same time, we're really trying to optimize these materials, understand them and optimize their performance so that uh, they will uh, stand the test of time when it comes to using them in construction applications. We also do some research on carbon capture materials and carbon storage. Um, I won't have time to talk about that uh, component of uh, the research today, but we have been doing a little bit of uh, investigation of new solid sorbents for carbon capture um, and understanding uh, both the synthesis of these uh, materials and also how they interact with CO2. So in a nutshell, how I describe the type of research we do is that we use material science approaches to discover and manipulate, so to optimize the fundamental behavior of materials with the idea that we're going to then enhance properties that manifest themselves at the micro and macro scale. And so, uh, for example, we combine atomistic and coarse grain simulations with synchrotron and neutron experiments um, and when we talk about cements and uh, trying to understand new types of cements, the kind of information that we're uh, getting at can be very important for understanding larger length scale like the microstructure and macroscopic properties. So we really concentrate more on the micron length scale and below with the impact being um, at the macroscopic length scale. Um, Keep in mind that there are properties that manifest themselves at the macroscopic level in materials where the processes are occurring uh, above the length scale we are looking at. Um, so not all of the uh, behavior of materials, if you look at the macroscopic level, are always um, tied back into the submicron length scale. Um, but what I'll be talking about today uh, is on the properties that are linked back to uh, the smaller length scales. And so to give you a bit of an idea of what my group gets up to, um, this is a very common plot that a lot of people show going across time scales and length scales, but we use a, a variety of both uh, computational and uh, experimental techniques, um, such as density functional theory, coarse grain Monte Carlo simulations. On the experimental side, uh, synchrotron and neutron techniques, such as computer tomography, pair distribution function analysis, quasi-elastic neutron scattering. We're trying to get at both the structure of a material, such as like the atomic structure, but we also trying to get at things such as uh, porous materials and what is the pore structure of a material. So 
Um, returning back to cement manufacturing, why are there CO2 emissions associated with the manufacturing of cement powder? Well, if you look at the industry, what happens is uh, you dig raw materials out of the ground. Uh, limestone is one, which is calcium carbonate and also clays. And you heat them up in the kiln to really high temperatures of 1,450 degrees Celsius thereabouts. And so what happens at about 900 degrees Celsius is you get this decomposition of the limestone. And so it forms lime, calcium oxide, and then there's the CO2. The reason why we go to higher temperatures is for the formation of calcium silicate phases that are reactive um, with water. So we have to go to these really high temperatures to get the right phase composition in the cement powder for it to be able to react with water. And so if you look at the fuels that are used to get to these really high temperatures, such as petroleum coke, the burning of those contribute about 45% of the CO2 emissions. And then this decomposition of the limestone contributes about 55% of the emissions, such that if you look at one ton of the cement powder that's produced out of the, uh, the plant, you're getting about a ton of CO2. Um, so this is not insignificant in terms of the, the CO2 that's been generated. Now, the industry and the wider community are very much aware of these CO2 emissions. And so there's been a lot done in terms of outlining the various approaches to reducing uh, the CO2 emissions associated with this industry. And it's not just one approach that's needed. There's a, a, a variety of approaches that together are needed to reduce the emissions. And so, uh, for example, here, energy efficiency of the kiln, advanced fuels, so not burning coke, uh, petroleum coke. There's this thing called clinker substitution, which is actually the cement powder. If you replace it with some other stuff, um, you can reduce CO2 emissions, but still get good performance of the concrete. And I'll talk a little bit about that from a material science perspective. And then carbon capture and storage is talked about as necessary in this industry to reduce emissions. There's also down here, I put innovative disruptive technologies and to specifically alternative cementitious materials. Essentially, can we make concrete without having to use Portland cement powder? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, and I'm going to talk about today how some of the fundamental research we do on both Portland cement and the alternative cementitious materials is giving us insight into how if, well, are they going to perform well long term and how the chemistry of the starting cement could impact that long term performance. So in terms of what my research group does, we look at this clinker substitution and also the alternative cementitious materials and beyond the cement industry, we look in general at carbon capture and storage. So before I can show the research that we've, we've been doing, I need to introduce some terminology. Um, because some of the phases that we look at uh, have uh, a complex terminology to them. So we have to go through it now. So what happens when you make concrete? Well, you mix Portland cement powder with uh, water. And I say potable water because you can't use briny salt water. Um, and then we mix it with sand and ag other aggregates, larger aggregates, and then you get concrete. Now, there's many phases that exist in this cement powder. There's actually four main phases that then when uh, you react it with water, you're creating four more uh, phases. Um, and it's quite a complex system in terms of what's going on at what time. However, it is known that the main phase that gives concrete strength is called calcium silicate hydrate gel. Um, and so this calcium silicate hydrate gel, people have looked into quite a, a lot uh, in over decades and decades. And so we have quite a good understanding of CSH gel. And this is cement notation because we have so many elements. Um, uh, the, the cement uh, community uh, creates, uh, well, it's got a cement notation. This is not carbon, sulfur, hydrogen. This is calcium silicate hydrate. Um, What's happening now, as we're trying to reduce the amount of Portland cement powder we need to make a certain amount of concrete, is we're adding in other materials. And so, for example, uh, if you add in uh, a glass 
um, uh, or well, good example actually is uh, calcined clays and specifically calcined kaolinitic clays. There's a lot of aluminium that comes along. And so what happens is the composition of the gel changes and so does the structure of the gel. Um, and uh, so we have somewhat of a good understanding of this cash gel, but not as much as the CSH gel. And so if we continue going on with other elements, sodium, for example, you can get this, this CNASH gel, well, sorry, uh, the CSH gel with sodium in it. And then also when you have sodium and aluminium, you get this CNASH gel. So we really need to understand what impact the additional elements have on the structure of this gel and also how um, if the thermodynamics of the gel changes. And it's very hard to analyze this gel within the concrete system because of all of those other phases that exist. So um, what I'm going to show today is some um, uh, computational chemistry research we've done on just the uh, gel itself to give uh, us some information on the thermodynamics and also some experimental results that were found um, on these, well, that we've uh, discovered for these systems. One thing I should mention right now is I've been saying gel, and a lot of people think gel is like a gooey kind of material that you put in your hair, for example, or sol gel synthesis for another example. Where but however, here I'm talking about a mechanically hard material. So it's, it's got high compressive strength. The reason why it's called a gel is because it's not perfectly crystalline. It contains water in it. Um, people have made analogies with sol gel synthesis. And so that's why uh, the term gel is used a lot in the community. Also, um, we work on alkali activated concrete. And so this type of alternative concrete you can make using uh, metallurgical slags. So uh, actually amorphous glasses that are in these metallurgical slags uh, we use. You can use fly ash, which is a byproduct from the coal industry, calcine clays I've mentioned before. But say if you um, add calcine clays to water, they're not going to react. So we need to activate the clay to get it to dissolve. And then for a, a mechanically strong binder phase to, um, to form, to give concrete strength. And so we use an alkaline activation process, for example, a sodium silicate, a high pH uh, system. And then this is um, alkali activated concrete down here that's actually been made with a combination of uh, blast furnace slag, and also fly ash. And it behaves at the macroscopic level in a very similar fashion to Portland cement concrete, but the fundamental phases within this material are different. And so we wanna understand how those phases impact long-term performance of this material. So in terms of the gels that give the concrete strength here, there's once again, this canash uh, gel that exists, but that's only when you have a lot of calcium in your system if you don't have calcium in your system, say if you've got alkali activated calcine clays, which are actually low in calcium, you end up with a different gel, which we call NASH. And so the question is, what impact does the different gels have on the performance of these concretes? I'm not going to go into the NASH system today. We're going to concentrate on the calcium rich systems, but there's very important, it is very important to understand these differences um, and uh, are there certain applications where you want to use one concrete over another, for example? Okay, so what we know and what we don't know. The long-term performance of blended Portland cements and alkali activated materials is not well established. So this in some ways is inhibiting their use by industry. Um, we need to develop standards and codes that allow for their use, but we also want to be able to predict long-term performance of these new materials without waiting 50 years. And so there is the need to be able to do, um, well, the need for fundamental research to help with the prediction of how these materials will perform. And the long-term performance is linked to what's, well, it's the durability of the material, how resistant it is to degradation. And this can be caused by instabilities in the, in the gel itself. So understanding uh, kinetics and thermodynamics is important. And also the pore structure of this material is very important. 
because there are aggressive chemicals that get into concrete and degrade it. And it's kind of funny to know, well, not, it, not everyone knows this, but carbon dioxide actually degrades concrete. Um, there's other ions as well. Well, there's ions as well that degrade concrete such as chloride and sulfates. And what they do is they permeate through the pore structure of the concrete. Um, and then they can cause phases to dissolve or they can rust, cause rusting of the steel for, uh, and as another example. Um, so the pore structure of concrete is very important. What I'm gonna to show today is very much at the atomic length scale, but I want to get across the, uh, it's very important to get across the fact that these systems are heterogeneous and they're heterogeneous across length scales. Um, so uh, the results that we get from the animistic level can be used to infer uh, what's happening at the macroscopic level or say how you change the chemical composition, how that might affect macroscopic level, but there are other properties at different length scales, such as the micron length scale that are also important to know. And so this is uh, X-ray fluorescence data of alkylate faded slag. And you can see here, well, we've circled here, um, uh, unreacted slag particle. There's also these iron rich particles that are there, the gels forming, but the gel isn't um, uniform. There's different compositions. Um, and this is only eight microns in size. So uh, it's, there's a lot of heterogeneities even at the micron length scale. If you go to a larger length scale, it gets even more complicated. You've got uh, phases uh, reacting, the different particles that you start off with, things forming in terms of the gel, and then concrete itself has aggregates in it. And so that's even at a higher length scale. However, we're going back to the atomic length scale for this presentation. And so our next slide is actually research, but I just want to make sure that we're on the same page with understanding what this, these gels are. Okay, so on the left on this slide, is a representation of the calcium silicate hydrate gel without showing oxygen atoms, without showing hydrogen atoms, but just showing the calcium ions and these silicate chains. And so what's known is it has this layered structure at the nanoscale. Um, these chains are of finite lengths um, that can be uh, quantified using nuclear magnetic resonance. And then there's this calcium oxide layer. And these calciums is actually interlayer calciums and they're solvated by water molecules. So this is CSH and it's quite well known the structure of CSH. If we add sodium and aluminium into these systems, um, we know some things. We know that aluminium substitutes for silicon atoms in what's known as these bridging sites, which for example is shown here, it bridges across the interlayer region, the, the uh, hydrated region. Um, and we know that the system has structural similarities to CSH gel. We know that there's these uh, silicate, aluminosilicate chains that exist. They have finite length. The stuff that we don't know so well is what sodium does to the system. Um, and so that's what I'm going to concentrate on today is can we understand the impact of sodium on the structure of the gel? And can we understand the impact of sodium on the thermodynamics of the gel as well? So the first question we have is about this thermodynamics and specifically what is the impact of sodium on the stability of the CSH gel? Is it as thermodynamically stable as the uh, conventional CSH gel? Um, because this can give us some uh, indication of if uh, the gel is going to change over time once the concrete has been poured in place. And we don't want the gel to change over time because that can uh, end up causing volume changes for the concrete. Um, it can cause a loss of gel and therefore a loss of strength. It could cause the gel to be more prone to degrade um, when aggressive ions come in. So we really wanna have an understanding of the stability of this gel. 
So um, the impact of high sodium concentrations is not well known. And so what we've done here is use density functional theory, computational chemistry, to determine the impact of sodium on some model uh, phases. And so uh, as you're probably aware with computational chemistry, there's a limitation to what size systems you can study. Um, larger system sizes, you tend to use force field based techniques. Here we're using density functional theory because we want to get accurate information on the energetics of the system. But the, uh, we have to compromise on the system size. And so that's why we're using uh, crystalline analogs for what this disordered gel, the gel that we know is not a crystalline phase. So specifically here, we're using what's known as 14 angstrom tobamorite. And we've also used another one known as clino tobamorite. And so for 14 angstrom tobamorite, the structure is very similar to CSH gel, but these um, silicate chains are infinite in length. They're not chopped up like they are in the CSH gel. So that's the main difference between the two. So what we did in this study was we substituted the calcium atom in the interlayer with different atoms. And also we uh, looked at the change in the thermodynamics of the system when we put aluminium in on one of those bridging sites for the silicon. We also ass assessed other potential substitution sites, especially for the, uh, the sodium and potassium, but they were found to be very unfavorable. These calculations were done using plain wave um, uh, calculations, uh, specifically VASP um, and also the Siesta software. And from these calculations, we can get a variety of uh, properties of the uh, crystal. Um, such as what's the substitution energy cost uh, when you replace, say, a calcium for a sodium? Does that change the overall volume of the system? Does it change bond strength? Can the cations uh, diffuse around more easily? And there's other properties as well. So here's a plot, and I'm going to talk you through the results. Um, what we did was for every single structure, we calculated what's known as this cohesive energy, which is the average energy per atom that the system gains by the atoms wanting to bond with each other as opposed to all of the atoms being um, separate. So this cohesive energy is a way of knowing how strongly the atoms want to bond together in this system. If the atoms didn't want to bond together, then you would have uh, the energy being zero. Um, the other uh, thing that we did here is uh, we calculated the cohesive energy for all of the different uh, structures we had. And then we looked at differences in the cohesive energies between different structures to get a sense of the impact of that substitution on the stability of the material, the phase. Um, and specifically, if you do the substitution, do you have a decrease in this uh, formation energy? If so, that means that there's an energy penalty to having that different atom in your structure. And overall, that means that your structure is less stable, it could be more prone to change over time. And so what you see on this slide here is if you replace a calcium for a magnesium in the interlayer, it is less stable. If you replace the same calcium with sodium, it's even less stable compared to the magnesium. Likewise, if you do a sodium substitution and also an aluminium for a silicon site, it ends up down here. And then potassium's over here as well. I'm not gonna go into the volume for the time being. So overall, these calculations show on this slide that any of these substitutions that you do uh, makes uh, a structure that is uh, less favorable um, from a thermodynamic viewpoint, so not good. However, something that we saw, actually, I'll, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. Something that we saw 
was if we bring a hydrogen atom into the system as well, along with the sodium, this leads to a more stable structure um, compared to just say the sodium by itself. And so there's a sequence of events that we saw happening when we uh, placed hydrogen into the system near the sodium. And specifically what happened is this hydrogen formed a hydroxyl um, with the silicate unit close to the sodium. And this also what we found is that we wanted, uh, it wanted a symmetric charge distribution around the sodium. So we actually ended up with these two hydroxyl units um, forming, and then there's another hydroxyl floating around in the system. Um, but this ended up with a more symmetric charge distribution around the, the sodium, which we think is leading to a more stable system overall. So if we do that for the structures that we looked at previously, it does have a very significant impact um, on the overall energy of the system. And so if we look at uh, the energies of the structures with respect to the original structure, you can see now that um, if we've uh, essentially charge compensated with the sodium, we're almost as stable as the CSH gel. Um, likewise, with the sodium and the aluminium, we move even further up on this diagram. So having these hydroxyl units in the vicinity of the sodium and in the vicinity of the aluminium is important in these calculations from a thermodynamic viewpoint. So it's an indication that it could also be important um, in the real system itself. I have a, there's a question that's popped up on the chat and there's the question is, are these gels the clinker? Uh, they are not. So um, to describe what clinker is, because uh, I, I assume that not everyone knows what clinker is, if we go back to this slide here, what comes out of the kiln is actually called clinker. Um, and then that gets blended with gypsum to make Portland cement powder. And then you mix Portland cement powder with water, and that's when the CSH gel forms. Um, so this CSH gel is a, what's known as a hydration product when you mix the cement powder with water. So um, just to recap, what we found is um, essentially a charge balancing mechanism whereby if you replace a calcium atom with a sodium atom, uh, if we have a hydrogen atom that's in the vicinity as well, that's added, then we end up with a, a, a stable structure that's comparable to the uh, initial tobamorite crystal structure. Now you might say, okay, why don't you, why a hydrogen? Why not another atom? And we also tried um, one calcium for two sodiums. And that's not as energetically favorable. So we found that the, the hydrogen atom, probably because of its size is um, favorable to have. Um, whereas if you're looking at say two sodium, they take up too much room and that's causing some of the issues when it comes to the overall energy of the system. So we can look at things such as bond strength, um, the impact of, of having the hydrogen in the system on the bond strength. And so if you look here, this is the baseline CSH. What we're looking at is um, electron density contour plots between different atoms. And specifically here, we're looking at between an interlayer calcium and surrounding oxygen atoms. If that calcium is replaced by sodium, you see that the electron uh, density contour plots, there's, uh, there's less of them uh, in, in well, the contours, there's less of them. Um, and also uh, there's, uh, they're not as uh, a black 
um, which is giving you an indication that there's weaker bonding happening between these atoms. However, when there's a hydrogen in the system as well, you can see that the bonding strength has increased. So this is one of the ways that we've been able to get a sense of what hydrogen is having, what impact it's having on the system through this charge balancing mechanism. Um, we also saw uh, uh, what uh, happened in this system without the hydrogen. If you've got a sodium in the system and you've also got aluminium in the bridging site, um, you don't have a symmetric charge distribution around the sodium. However, when you have charge balance this structure, we do end up with a nice um, uh, symmetric charge distribution around the sodium, which seems to enhance the stability of the structure. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, for this uh, part of the research is how easy it is for either calcium or the sodium to move in the interlayer region of the structure, which is that hydrated region. And so we did these um, calculations whereby we can calculate the barrier to diffusion. Is the atom uh, can it easily diffuse around, which would be an indication that those elements, well, that element can easily leach out of the system, for example, or is it kind of stuck quite well in its location and it can only uh, diffuse in the local vicinity of uh, where it originally sits. And so here, what I'm showing is just for sodium in the interlayer with and without hydrogen. Um, charge balancing mechanism. And so without, what we find is the barrier to diffusion um, is 1.1 electron volts. What you can see is the barrier increases when uh, you charge balance uh, using a hydrogen atom. So this is indicating that you can add sodium to the system. So you can have a sodium containing gel um, as long, well, if you have a sodium containing gel, you can get a gel that probably will perform in a similar manner to a CSH gel, so long as you have hydroxylated uh, regions within the material. And what I mean by that is having the hydrogens present that are bonded to oxygens. So you need to have an ample supply of protons for charge balancing to form these hydroxyl units. However, in, in concrete, I haven't mentioned this yet, but in concrete, the pH is quite high internally. It's about 12.5 or 13. So the higher the pH, the less protons you have. Um, and so this means that you're more unlikely to have uh, this charge balancing that could occur. So what the idea is, could we could we synthesize concretes using more mild conditions um, and enhance the stability of these gels? Um, so that's something that uh, we have yet to look at extensively, but is an idea for future research um, from an experimental viewpoint is, is there ways we can catalyze the, the gel formation in a concrete system without having such high internal pH conditions? So that's the first thing uh, I wanted to talk about today in terms of uh, research. Uh, what we're going to look at now is what happens if we are not just replacing one calcium with a sodium and a proton, but two more calciums in the system. Uh, because the Kanash gel that forms, uh, there's going to be different amounts of sodium that's incorporated into the gel, depending on how much sodium is in the vicinity when the gel's forming. That's a, an assumption that we have is if you have a low amount of sodium when the gel's forming, you only get a, get a little bit of sodium ending up in the structure. Whereas if you have a lot higher concentration of sodium um, during the formation of the gels, then it's more likely that a lot more sodium is going to end up in the phase, which could affect the performance of the gel. Once again, we did this from a computational viewpoint. And uh, specifically here, we used a different structure. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's called clinoturbomorite. There was reasons why we looked at this structure. And so what we did is in the interlayer region, and this is the interlayer region of this structure, 
uh, we systematically replaced uh, single calcium atoms with sodium um, and looked at uh, the energy of the system with replacement, say, of one and then two and three and four and, and so on. Um, once again, we did these calculations using VAS. And once again, we could analyze various properties of the uh, structures that um, came out of the calculations. So we can look at the formation energies of uh, these uh, structures with respect to the original uh, clinotorba molarate structure. And so what um, we can find is that uh, they, well, I'm gonna show it on the next slide when it's with respect to the clinotorba molarate structure, but what's shown on this page is that if you put the sodium atoms in different locations, so you can choose in the interlayer region, essentially what substitution to do. Um, that's what we had to do here. We did it manually. What we found is the location of substitution does matter. So if you think about this um, interlayer region that we have in these gels, there's calcium atoms in that interlayer region. And so, do you replace calcium atoms that are in the vicinity of each other or do you replace calcium atoms as far as part as possible for example and so what we found here is we want to have a symmetric distribution of the calcium atoms to end up with a lower energy um, structure meaning that it's more stable whereas if there's a less symmetric uh, replacement that's done we found that the structure is uh, uh, less stable. So it's more stable when this, uh, the replacement is symmetric, it's less stable when the replacement is uh, less symmetric. What is shown on this slide is that result. And specifically here, this is that energy difference between not symmetric and symmetric for the distribution of the atoms. And what we show here as we go up on the x-axis is with increasing sodium content of the crystal, what happens to the formation energy of the system, which you can think of is, is there an energy penalty to having sodium in some of the locations where calcium originally was in that interlayer region? And the answer is yes, there is an energy penalty, but it only manifests itself after a certain amount of sodium is incorporated into the structure. And this is interesting. This is giving an indication that you can have some sodium present, but there's a point where you get too much sodium. And so um, uh, what uh, is likely going to be important from an experimental viewpoint or from a, you know, in, in uh, if you make these concretes is you don't want to dose the system with too much sodium because it could be causing uh, the gel to be less stable, which could make it more prone to change over time. We also looked at some um, other uh, properties of the structure, such as the, the bonding strength. And so what we found was that with low sodium contents, you have stronger bonding between the silicon and oxygen. As you go up to really high sodium contents, then you're ending up with a lot weaker bonding between the silicon and oxygen atoms. So this would make it easier for these bonds to break because they're not as strong. So the implications from this uh, these calculations is there appears to be an upper limit of sodium incorporation into the structure above which the stability of the structure decreases. And so a similar limit to the amount of sodium may exist in the disordered CSH gel structure. And this is still to be proven the case because what we're doing here is we're using a model crystalline structure to infer what is likely occurring in the disordered gel. But without looking at the disordered gel directly, we can only infer, we can't prove that it's the case. And so, for example, there could be ways of using, say, force field molecular dynamics simulations to explore the same question, but you're looking at also the impact of disorder on the system so that you're more representative of what we know these gels to be like in real life. 
So what I should mention though, there are a bit of caveats from the uh, study that we've done because there are other differences that we know that occurs when sodium is added to the system in terms of the structure of the gel. So what I showed previously a while ago was I told you that the silicate chains in CSH gel, the, the conventional gel, they're finite in length. They're of particular length. Um, the length of these chains, when you add sodium into the system, it is known that these chain lengths get shorter. And so this will also impact the thermodynamics of the gel, um, which we haven't actually uh, looked at with these uh, computational calculations. But on the next slide, we're going to look at this from an experimental viewpoint. So what we've done here is that uh, we've made synthetic gels. So we've, we've, we can um, synthesize gels that are reminiscent of the real gels in real concrete. And we've synthesized them using different sodium contents and with and without aluminium. Now, there's one thing that uh, people have assumed is that these synthetic gels are representative of the real gels that we find in the real concrete. And I'm going to discuss that today when it comes to one of the alkali activated concrete, whether this uh, assumption is realistic. Um, so that's one thing we're going to look at. And the other thing that we're going to look at just with the synthetic gels is the impact of sodium on the structure of the gel. So these gels were made um, with and without sodium and alumina. Um, and what we did was once we synthesized them, we used uh, nuclear magnetic resonance to look at the silicate connectivity in the gels. And we also used a technique known as X-ray pair distribution function analysis to look at the local structure of the gels. And so firstly, NMR was used to quantify what's known as the degree of silicate polymerization in the gel, where down here is um, uh, what, can, what the silicates can do. So for a silica unit, silicon bonded to four other oxygens, that silica unit in these gels could be standalone. It, couldn't, it might not be bonded to another silica unit. It might have calciums around it instead, for example. Or it could be bonded to one other silica unit. It could be bonded to two. It could be bonded to three. Or it could be bonded to four. And so this is known as Q notation, where you go from Q naught up to Q4. Q4 is the most polymerized the silica can be. Q0 is the least polymerized the silica can be. So we can quantify this using nuclear magnetic resonance. And this is what's done on this slide right here. There's the chemical shift on the x-axis. This is silicon NMR. And the spectra give an indication of what Q exists for the silica units. And so here in this region, it's Q0, in this region, it's Q1, in this region, it's Q2. We made a gel using the starting composition of calcium to silicon of one, and we synthesized the gel in different sodium hydroxide concentrations, no sodium hydroxide, one molar, five molar. So when you synthesize the gel without sodium hydroxide in there, we end up with this spectrum here, which shows that this structure, this gel, mainly consists of Q2 silicate units. So silicate units tend to be bonded to two other silicate units, and that's reminiscent of those silica chains that I was talking about previously. Now, when the sodium content increases, what we find is that things are shifting towards the left on this screen. And so the gel is becoming more depolymerized due to the presence of sodium during synthesis of the gel. So we can actually quantify this change in uh, silica connectivity by actually calculating the center of gravity for each of these spectra. And then I'm gonna plot um, the center of gravity for a whole lot of samples on the next slide. This is what's shown here. So on the x-axis, um, the gels were synthesized using various uh, concentrations of sodium hydroxide. We actually synthesized gels with varying ratios of calcium to silicon, and we're plotting the center of gravity 
from the NMR results versus sodium hydroxide concentration that was used for synthesis. And what you can see is this center of gravity decreases for all of the different compositions, which is showing you're going from a high degree of polymerization when there's no sodium to a lower degree of polymerization when there's more sodium. So what this is meaning is you're getting shorter chains of the silicate units when sodium is present, which could make the structure more prone to degradation, which is not a good thing. However, I will talk a little bit about the role of alumina that can com combat this, um, this uh, shorter chain lengths. Um, so if you have sodium and alumina, this can lead to uh, similar chain lengths to the normal CSH gel. What we also did um, was X-ray pair distribution function analysis on the same gels. And so uh, to do this technique, we went to a synchrotron. We specifically went to Argonne National Lab, the advanced photon source. And you can think of it as conventional X-ray diffraction, um, but on steroids. I don't know if that's a good term. <laughs> What it is, is that you're using the high brilliance of the x-rays from the synchrotron to scatter from your sample, which means that you're getting a lot more x-rays being detected, which leads to higher resolution data. It also means that um, you can, uh, depending on the energy of the x-rays, you can get different two theta coverage of your x-ray diffraction pattern, which means that um, you can do Fourier transforms of your diffraction data and look at the data in real space. And so that's what's shown on this slide to, go, to actually get the pair distribution function from diffraction data. This is neutron data and on the x-axis is momentum transfer. It's related to two theta, scattering angle, and y-axis is, is intensity. And so here we're going out to high Q. This is, uh, if you think about an X-ray, a lab X-ray diffractometer um, using copper as the wavelength. Um, so uh, a copper X-ray tube, the highest Q max you can get is out to eight. Um, so at synchrotron and neutron facilities, you can get to much higher Q max values you can cover more of momentum transfer, which means when you Fourier transform the data, you end up with better resolution in real space. And so what's shown over here is a sample that has both diffuse scattering, so scattering from amorphous component in the material, and also the spikes of the Bragg pigs, the crystalline contributions. So you're Fourier transforming both the disordered component, the amorphous or some sort of disordered component if it's present. And also if there's crystalline contributions, you're Fourier transforming that and you're ending up with your pair distribution function over here, which is a histogram of all atom-atom distances in your material. And so it shows you bond lengths and then it shows you longer range distances between atoms. And so for something that's predominantly amorphous, which is the case here, a calcium aluminosilicate glass, you've got your bond lengths, and then you end up with some medium range ordering. But once you go out to large distances between atoms, there's no ordering. And so um, you just have the data sitting at around zero. So what we're gonna do now is look at the data for those gels that we synthesized using X-ray pair distribution function. And that's what's shown on this slide here. And so what we have is bond lengths. Um, T stands for tetrahedral silicon or tetrahedral aluminium. So there's a silicon oxygen, aluminium oxygen bond length, calcium oxygen bond length. And then we look at distances between atoms. We're not no longer in the bond length region. And so what you can see is the different uh, concentrations for synthesis do change the amount of calcium that's into the system, but not so much what's going on out um, in the medium range ordering. Um, what we did for fun was actually to take the intensity, so the Y value of this data here for this local peak, which is related to the distance between silicon silicon and silicon aluminium. And so if you have more of these distances that show up, we think it's an 
uh, indication of the degree of polymerization of the material. And actually, what we found when we plotted these intensities is, yes, we end up with a similar plot to the NMR data. This is kind of cool. We can actually look at local structure in terms of coordination, whether it's more coordinated or less coordinated with other silicate units using this X-ray uh, technique. Um, and uh, when we compared with the NMR results, which is shown on this plot, there's a, there's a trend there. Um, PDF analysis is not going to be, pair distribution function analysis is not going to be as accurate as NMR. But it was interesting to see that we could get this, this correlation between the two. And so what we find is when you have a high degree of polymerization, we have high, al sorry, we have low alkali concentration, low amount of sodium. Whereas if we've got a high amount of sodium, we have a low degree of polymerization. What's shown here in gray is the span for the gels that tend to be in Portland cement concrete. And what's shown here in the purpley blue is the span that we have for the gels that exist in alkali activated concrete. So it's important with the chemical composition of your system to choose it carefully because it's nice to be in this region. We're gonna have a more polarized gel. It's likely gonna be more stable compared to if we're down this end on the plot. I've essentially said this um, already, but it's, it's the degree of polymerization that's very important. And so what we found was that as you add silicate, sorry, as you add sodium to the system, alkalis, it causes the silicate chains to depolymerize. This might be of a concern because the lower coordinated these silicate units are with each other, it's likely easier for uh, the silica to dissolve over time in aggressive environments. But on the flip side, we know that al aluminium increases this uh, degree of polymerization, makes it more polymerized. And so that's a good uh, addition to have if you're gonna have sodium coming at the same time, which means when you're making concrete, if you're trying to reduce the amount of Portland cement powder and you're using something that has sodium in it, you also want it to have reactive alumina in there as well. Very much lastly, um, we're going to look at nanoscale ordering of these gels. So I've plotted out to a lot further in R space, in real space for the pair distribution function. And you can see how the correlations, these atom-atom distances die off a lot more quickly for this uh, dark sample that's um, denoted here as AAS compared to the purple sample. There's a difference between these two. One is the gel that's in alkali activated slag. So it was in a cement sample um, and we were able to subtract out other contributions from other phases and look at the contributions just from the gel. And then the purple is just a synthetic gel. There's clear differences in the nanoscale ordering, how ordered the gel is, um, which can have implications for um, uh, how people currently use these synthetic gels to understand the Portland cement system. There's a question, yes. It looks like I might need to ask Miguel to unmute. So just give me one minute. Does the room want to participate? Oh, sorry, just one second, Claire. Okay, go ahead, Miguel. No, I, I prefer to do it at the end. Okay, I don't want to interrupt. Just, just to finish. With okay, one I'm near the end. Please. All right. Well, at least I've got one question. That's great. Um, so the nanoscale ordering is different between the synthetic and real gels, which means that we want to be careful with the results that we get on these synthetic gels to infer um, details such as thermodynamic uh, uh, stability, but not thermodynamic stability, but that's the wrong word, to calculate uh, things such as solubility product of the gel that then gets used in uh, thermodynamic modeling. Because the more crystalline a, a phase is, typically that means it's more thermodynamically stable, which means that its solubility product is going to be different. So 
for example, because I know I've kind of twisted this up a bit, let's use an example. Greater crystallinity implies increased thermodynamic stability. And let's use silica as the example here. If you have an amorphous silica versus crystalline quartz, and you look at their solubilities, the amorphous silica is 10 times more soluble compared to the quartz. This, a similar argument could potentially be the case here, whereby the more disordered gel, this real gel, um, is less thermodynamically stable compared to the synthetic gel. So we need to be careful about using um, thermodynamic data and specifically things like solubility product for the synthetic gels for inputs to thermodynamic modeling, because essentially the community uses a lot of thermodynamic modeling to predict phase composition in the concrete. And um, the, 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 the thermodynamic data for the gels comes from these synthetic gels. What we've shown is there's differences um, in terms of the nanoscale ordering between the synthetic and the real gel in this alkali debated system. We need to now look at the Portland cement system to see if a similar thing exists um, between the synthetic and the real gel um, for Portland cement concrete. There is also potential implications here from an industrial level. Um, there's opportunities to try to increase the degree of nanoscale ordering of the gels in real concrete. If we could do that, then we would be increasing uh, the, the essentially how resistant the gels would be to change over time, especially in aggressive environments. Um, and so this is some of the things that we're looking into is, is there ways to increase the degree of crystallinity of the gels um, whilst these systems form? And if so, what impact does that have on their uh, durability, how resistant they are to different aggressive environments? All right, so I'm gonna stop, that's it. Um, essentially, I've talked a lot about sodium in these uh, cement gels um, and various implications. I'm going to go to the acknowledgement slide in terms of funding, uh, facilities, collaborators, and current students, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, Miguel, would you like to uh, start us off? Yes, yes, thank you. Well, Claire, thank you very much for this uh, really, really interesting talk. I think uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, two questions. One is, uh, you know, I am an electron microscopist and I always, you know, discuss with my friends who do X-ray diffraction that uh, in electron microscopy, we see the radiation damage when we look at the sample. So we cannot get rid of the radiation damage. And many people in X-rays assume that there is no radiation damage. So my, my question, but there is radiation damage, probably less than electrons, but uh, important. So could be possible that some of the polymerization that you're looking are produced by the X-rays in your, in your experiments? Because the X-rays will increase the polymerization. Do you see that like a possibility that are a result of radiation damage? Yeah, that's a that, very good question. Um, so we use high energy X-rays around 60 uh, kilo electron volts. Um, there is known for uh, x-rays that you can get significant uh, uh, beam damage for materials in what's known as the water window, which I don't remember the exact values, but it could be around one to two kilo electron volts. So for carbon and water systems, that's kind of you're using x-rays in that region. You want to be very careful because you are ending up with beam damage. From the studies that we've done, whereby um, if we expose uh, the sample to x-rays and we look at changes over time, we haven't seen any indication that, you know, if you have a very short exposure versus longer exposures, that we're getting change in the scattering pattern, which would indicate a change in uh, the structure due to beam damage. Um, so from our um, from our results, we don't have an indication that it is occurring. Um, and, and that, that, we, I'm sorry, 
Yeah, we've also done like um, time dependent studies. So we actually follow how these cement forms over time and they do agree with other experimental techniques such as NMR and others. So we, we think the beam damage doesn't occur because we're not in the water window where it's known to be significant. Okay. And, and then uh, but I just want to mention that now in the electron microscope, you can put samples in a liquid, liquid uh, 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 stage, okay? And you can use very, very low electron diffraction to do also PDF, which is very, very good. It was, but, but I have another question, and this is very important. What, you, what is your opinion of adding to the uh, concrete some materials based on carbon, such as, you know, graphene or carbon nanotubes or some, which are totally inert, they do not react. Uh, do you think that will be a benefit assuming that uh, one can produce these materials cheaply? Do you, you see any advantage? Um, yeah, I'll answer that. I want to go back to the um, the, the statement about electron diffraction and, and uh, like pair distribution function analysis. I've always wanted to do that um, and I've never gotten around to it, but I mean, We've got questions about the local structure of the materials at like spatially resolved. What is the local structure of materials at something where like you can get at it with TEM. And I think that's very, very exciting to do. So um, I fully agree that, you know, that's a really um, would be very beneficial and uh, but we've yet to get around to it. Um, the, the addition of carbon materials like carbon nanotubes and all of the rest um, to concrete, it depends on what function you want them to serve. So people have found that they've increased uh, macroscopic properties in a favorable way. Um, carbon is also conductive. So people have looked at using it as a way of heating up concrete. Say if you're in a region that freezes all the time, can you actually heat up the concrete to thaw out ice? Um, so, I think nanotechnology um, combined with concrete can be very useful. Um, what people find is the question is how much, how much does it cost? So I would say that if um, you have a low cost way of making carbon based materials, especially those that um, have high surface areas, they can be very beneficial to uh, certain properties of the concrete. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, uh, really, uh, congratulations again for your great work. Thank you. Thanks. Looks like we've got a couple more questions in the, the chat, or uh, a couple other people have their hands up. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Jake, would you like to ask your, ask your question? Sure. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for the talk. Uh, I found it very interesting. Um, and it's funny, actually, that uh, cost just got brought up because that had to do with the question that I was thinking this whole time is it's probably going to be very difficult to sell to companies uh, an alternative to concrete just because of what it is and what it's used for. And I was wondering how uh, the materials that you're using, if that has a large like cost effect on how much it would take uh, to implement it like on the mass uh, on like a mass scale in general. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a very uh, relevant question, um, both in terms of cost but also availability of raw materials. Um, the amount of concrete we use is vast. We use uh, so much concrete; it's second only in terms of volume that we use to water. So water is the most consumed material on Earth by society, concrete is second. Um, so you really need to look at uh, using materials that are abundant on the earth's crust around the world. And limestone is one of them and clays are also one of them. Um, so with a lot of the research we're doing now, um, the availability of the metallurgical slags and the fly ash is not huge. Um, fly ash, hopefully the amount will go down over time um, because coal power hopefully is going to be reduced in terms of its usage and the metallurgical slags are just not produced in um, uh, high enough quantity that we could uh, there would be excess to be able to use for the alternative cements 
and that leaves calcine clays. So there are a lot of clays on the Earth's crust. So the hope is with the alternatives using something like the calcine clays would be a viable uh, approach. Now, let's get back to cost. Um, if you try and make, say, alkali activated concrete using the current uh, cost of the starting ingredients, especially the activator, it's hard to be cost competitive. Um, one of the reasons is the, the activators are, are very high quality for the moment because they're produced for industries like the food industry or the paper industry. Um, and so because of this high quality means that high cost. Um, so um, as with any kind of new technology, the hope is that over time, once uh, supply chains get set up, those kind of things, the cost will decrease. Um, the other on the flip side as well is with carbon incentives, uh, as those come into play, that will also make it more uh, attractive to use alternative types of concrete. And for example, in New Jersey at the moment, they're trying to pass a bill whereby there are incentives if the government projects are to be using um, sustainable types of concrete. The last thing I'll leave with that question is a comparison to another technology that started out a lot more expensive and over time has significantly decreased. And that's photovoltaics, solar cells. Um, a decade ago, they were a lot more expensive compared to what they are now. Um, now they're cost competitive with other forms of uh, how we produce electricity. Uh, a decade ago, that was not the case. Um, and so that shows as an industry grows, as a material um, is used more extensively, uh, the economics get better. Very interesting. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Claire. Let's thank Claire one more time.